B'Shem Hashem Na'asev and Asliyah We are continuing on our Zerah Shimshon series on the parasha. We are on Parashat Shemini We will be doing Bezrat Hashem Ot Bet Ma'amar Bet, the second Ma'amar of the Zerah Shimshon on Parashat Shemini This Shi'ur is dedicated for the Refu'ah Shelema of Kol Chole Am Yisrael Especially Ahava Kadosh Bat Neda and Tinok Ben Shiran and Yeshayahu ben Sarah. May Hashem give all the Chole Am Yisrael Erfat Nefesh, Erfat Guf, Bekarov, Amen. And it's dedicated for the Leilui Nishmat, um, the Kadosh Harav Chaim Kanievsky that just uh, passed away. May Zechutot Agen Alenu. He was actually somebody that. Um, also um, supported the learning of the Zerah Shimshon. They actually in- interviewed him about the Zerah Shimshon and the Segulot that the Zerah Shimshon has, and he literally put a stamp on it. He said, yes, people should learn this weekly. Um, and Afsh, what was his name? Um, last from last week, Leilu Nishmato, Baba Zade, Ashim, Yoshua Baba Zade. Okay. So Ita be Midrash Pelia, Midrash Pelia brings, and also brought down. It's, he says it's also brought down in Kesef Nivhar. When Nadav and Avihu were burnt and they, were, they, were, they died in the Parashat Shemini, um, for those that don't know, Nadav and Avihu were, were Aharon HaKohen's um, sons. They were very, very holy people, extremely holy people. They, during the inauguration of the Mishkan, they decided on their own to bring a to bring a, 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 a korban, an offering for Hashem. Now, as the parasha says, they were not asked to bring an offering to Hashem. There's a lot that is spoken about when it comes to the situation of Nadava Nevihu. We're not even going to touch the surface here. But they were not asked to bring a korban because they were not asked to bring an offering. They brought an offering and right away, right there, they were burnt alive. And that the way Chachamim say it was is that their neshamot were, were sucked out through their nostrils and they died on the spot. What? But they were called nisrafim. They were burnt. Right? Because they were bringing a burnt offering, so to speak, and they were burnt right there by the Mizbeach because of what they did. So, now it says, at the time, the Midrash says something very interesting. Midrash says, at the time that Bnei Aharon were burnt, Amru Malachi Asharet, the ministering angels said to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Lama Karata Tayam Lifnehem, we don't understand. Why did you split the sea before these people? Heshivu Haserufim, the burnt ones. This is talking about Nadav and Avihu. That's who the burnt ones are. The burnt ones said to. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaShivenu HaShem Elecha V'Nashuva Kekedem. HaShivenu HaShem is basically from, from Megillat Echa, which basically means, HaShem, please bring us back to you, and we shall be like the beginning. And this is from the Midrash. Vehu Pele. And the Zerash Mishon says, this is, this is wondrous, it's a wonder, it's... It, it, it almost, you could possibly say that we're saying like, how does this even make sense? What just happened? Right? Why? What is the, what is the connection between the splitting of the sea and the death of Nadav and Avihu? The Midrash says, one more time, when Nadav and Avihu passed away, as their neshamot were going up, so to speak, the Malachah Asharet, the, the ministering angels came before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said, Why did you split the sea for them? What do Nadav and Avihu respond? Hashivenu Hashem Elecha V'Nashuva Kekedem Please bring us back to you, return us back to you, so it shall be like the beginning. What did it have to do with anything? 
ויובן המדרש פליאה And in order to understand this, you have to understand before that, there is a Midrash in Vaikra Rabbah that says, Shebene Aharon, the Midrash in Vaikra Rabbah gives us a little light onto what really happened here. Shebene Aharon metu bishvil chet Aharon sha'asait ha'egel. Why did the sons of Aharon, Nadav and Avihu, actually die, pass away? Because of the sin of their father for making the egel, for making the um, golden calf. Who made the golden calf? Aharon. I mean, it was the Jewish people that came and, you know, brought their gold and silver and stuff. But it was Aharon that was involved in it and gave them the way out to bring stuff and to make the golden calf. So Vaikra, the Midrash in Vaikra says, you know why Hashem took away Nadav and Avihu? Because of the sin of their father, who what? Who built the golden calf. Like Rashi says on the Pasuk, in the Pasuk of Chet Egel, in, uh, um, that talks about the Egel in Devarim, Tet Chaf, Uv Aharon hit Anaf Hashem Od Lahashmido. It says, and God became angered very angered by Aharon, and he wanted to lahashmido, to destroy him. And why? Because he made the egel, he had a hand in making the golden calf. And the Bozer Shimshon says, Ve'en hashmada, what does hashmada mean? Kilui banim. Lahashmid means to erase, to completely get rid of, to destroy. So it wasn't, the Pasuk says, Hashem wanted to completely destroy Aharon. Instead of saying, Hashem wanted to punish Aharon. Or Hashem, because of the building of the golden calf, God wanted to kill Aharon. He could have said that, right? He was, let's say Hashem could say he was chayav mitah. He was, he, he was obligated for the death penalty. It doesn't say that. It says hashmid. When it says hashmid, it means Aharon at that moment, when he did the chet aigal with the Jews, God had planned to erase his seed, which meant the entire nation of Aharon would have been erased. His kids, his grandkids, there would be no one from his lineage left. Total destruction, which is a huge deal. Because all we know from Aharon HaKohen is, all the Kohanim pretty much that we have are from, from Aharon HaKohen. Right? From Elazar and Tamar, his other two sons. Imagine if we didn't have that. You know the bracha, the priestly brachot of Aharon HaKohen. I mean, he was the Kohen Gadol, he was the high priest. Imagine at one point, he was to be destroyed, and all of his seed was to be destroyed. So over there says, Utfilato shel Moshe. It was the tefillah of Moshe Rabbeinu that begged HaKadosh Baruch Hu that Aharon should not be punished, and his kids should not be killed. As it says, he also prayed for Aharon. What did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? He made a deal. He went halfway. God punished Aharon by only taking away two of his children. Not all of them and not himself. Only two of them died. Remained. And we know part of the punishment for Aharon HaKohen was what? Who knows? What was the part of the punishment for Aharon himself? For the Chet Egel? Anybody? Everyone's asleep. I'm so boring. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehakol Enihi Amit Baro It's an easy one. When I say it, everyone's going to be like, ah. Can you do ah after I say the answer just to make me happy? He wasn't let to go into Eretz Israel, just like Moshe. Oh. No, but that's seriously an awe, though. <laughs> Moshe was not allowed to go into Eretz Israel. Aharon was also not allowed to go to Eretz Israel. Right? They were both part of the same thing. So part of Aharon's punishment was, instead of being killed, he was not let, let to go into Eretz Israel. It was remnants of this Avera as well. But he wasn't killed. His other children were not killed either, even though Hashem had planned to do it. But because of the tefillot of Moshe Rabbeinu, because Moshe Rabbeinu prayed to Hashem, just to give you a nuance of who Moshe Rabbeinu was. This is just on the side. 
was that, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to be the Kohen Gadol and the leader of Am Yisrael. That was the original plan. The original plan was Moshe Rabbeinu was going to be the leader and the Kohen Gadol. How? When Hashem was talking to him by the bush, the first time Hashem was appointing Moshe Rabbeinu to be the leader of Am Yisrael, Hashem was do- uh, Moshe was doing what? He was... Sure. Right. He was, uh, no, Hashem, please don't send me. There's other people. There's my brother. There's, uh, I have an older brother. For seven days, Hashem was trying to convince Moshe Rabbeinu to go and bring Bnei Israel out of Egypt. Because Moshe Rabbeinu argued with Hashem for seven days and he did not, because he was so anav, he was so humble. But he, because he argued too much, Hashem took away the kehuna, he took away priesthood from Moshe Rabbeinu. That's when the Torah says, don't worry, you're worried about Aharon, you know what, I'm giving priesthood to Aharon. He's going to be the priest, he's going to be the Kohen Gadol, so you don't have to worry about him being jealous, he'll be happy for you. Over there, Chachamim say, you know what this means? Priesthood was supposed to be for Moshe Rabbeinu. God only told Moshe Rabbeinu that Aaron's going to be the priest after he was arguing with him for seven days. So imagine now. If Aharon would be taken away right now, who would become the priest? Moshe Rabbeinu. Aharon made the Jews worship the Egel, the golden calf. What does Moshe Rabbeinu do? He begs HaKadosh Baruch Hu not to punish Aharon. That's a leader. He wanted nothing for himself. He was crying to Hashem day after day for Hashem not to take away Aharon, for him to be the priest. It's incredible. It's incredible to know what a person's capabilities are, what we can achieve, what we can become. So selfless, so amazing, so powerful. Moshe Rabbeinu's tefillot were so powerful because he, he literally did not have anything of his own. In his own mind, he felt like he has nothing of his own. He wanted everything for everybody else. He wanted to do for other people. That's why when Hashem was planning hashmada, total destruction for Aharon Kohen, Hashem listens to Moshe Rabbeinu and doesn't destroy him. Right? So that was the side note. So now, question now. If we look at it simply in the Pasukim, it seems that Aharon sinned here. He had a chet. He had a sin of having a hand or having the Jews build the golden calf. Question here is, listen carefully, guys. It'll get a little confusing, but it's beautiful. What really was the sin of Aharon? What did Aharon really do wrong here? Let's find out what he did wrong so bad that he deserved to be annihilated. Don't we know that his intention for building the golden calf was letova? It was all for the good. Let's be honest. Did Aharon really want to worship a golden calf? No. No one argues with that. Did Aharon Akohan want the Jews to worship the golden calf? Absolutely not. That was not part of the plan whatsoever. What was Aharon Akohan's intention? His intention was, he just watched another guy that told the Jews not to build a calf get killed, get crushed, Hur. Hur was killed, murdered on the spot. Now you have the next leader standing, which is Aharon Kohen. Moshe Rabbin was still on Har Sinai, receiving the Torah. What is he going to do here? Aharon is trying to stay alive, so that the Jews will have a leader, someone they'll at least listen to, who else is going to be left if he's dead? Right? So he tries to stall. So what does he say? He says, okay, I'll tell them. I'll tell them, go bring your gold, go bring your stuff. We'll, we'll make a leader. We'll make a... And by the way, the plan was never to build an idol. The golden calf was not supposed to be an idol to begin with. The Jews didn't want an idol. They didn't even ask for an idol. They said, Moshe Rabbeinu has gone. We used to have an intermediary between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We don't have that no more. We want to have an intermediary. We want something of, of, a, of, a, of a spiritual caliber to be between us. So they decided they want something. They didn't want to worship anything. So Aaron Akwain said, fine, I'll help you out. Go bring this, go bring that. 
Why a calf? Kabbalistically, there's so many reasons. You know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, calf is is one of the one of the animals that is uh, um, shown by the throne of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So they wanted intermediary to be uh, familiar to the heavens. So they picked the golden calf, so on and so forth. There's a lot that goes into it. But they didn't want to worship it, and neither did the Harun Akwan want them to worship anything. He just wanted to stall for time. He needed time for Moshe Rabbeinu to come back. Did he know? That someone's going to throw in a golden plate. There was a golden plate from the time that Moshe Rabbeinu went and found the coffin of Yosef HaTzadik from the river. That said, Alei Shor. It said, Rise Calf. Yosef, Yosef HaTzadik's sign was a calf, a shore. So Moshe Rabbeinu had this thing written. <clears throat> and he threw it into the Nile River. And Yosef's coffin came up. That's how he found Yosef's coffin and they carried it out of Egypt. As soon as Moshe Rabbeinu did that, somebody jumped in, grabbed it, and brought, him, brought it with them. When they put all the gold into the furnace to make a golden calf, this guy threw this piece in there. Out comes a living, talking, eating gold calf. Like it has powers. Right? Now, something that should have taken days took hours. Aharon Akwan did not plan for that. That was not part of the plan. So now he's saying his intention was all for good. He didn't really mean for this to happen. Kemosha Amru, like Chachamim tell us in the Gemara in Sanhedrin. And the Midrash says also in many different ways that his kavana was not bad. So what was his chet? What was his original sin? What was it? Because it has to be something. So he says what the, what the sin was it wasn't actually the making the golden calf per se itself. Ela mezidim. He made it so that the Jews, their sin of worshiping the golden calf became an intentional sin. From a shogeg to an intentional. What's a shogeg? Shogeg means unintentional. What? Accident. Unintentional. It made the sin become go from unintentional to intentional. Bemezid. How so? The Midrash says in Parashat Tzav, in Vaikra Rabbah, on the Pasuk of Mishle. Pasuk in Mishle says, Mishle chapter 10, Pasuk 12. Sin'a teorer medanim. So, what does that mean? Sheha sin'a means hatred. This hatred that Aharon gave, Aharon Akohen caused a certain hatred to come between God and his people. He orera lahem dine dinim. Medanim means din. Din means judgment. Aharon Akohen did something that brought a separating hatred between Hashem and Bnei Israel. That made Bnei Israel be judged. Aaron did something. He had a hand in something that caused judgment to come upon the Jews in a very bad way. What was this judgment and what did Aaron Akohen do? Zemel Ahmed, what does this teach us? Shaya Aaron notel korbanam. When the Jews were bringing korbanot for the golden calf, they were, they were trying to make sacrifices for the golden calf. It had gotten out of hand. It went from making a golden object to like, you know, let's serve, and let's bring sacrifices and people dancing around it like there's no tomorrow. Like, you know? Almost like the way some people worship science. <laughs> so when Aharon Cohen was taking these animals, the korbans from them, Ufo Hassan Lifnehem. What was he doing? He was degrading the korbanot. He was degrading the sacrifices in front of them. What was he doing? He was telling them, what are you, crazy? You're bringing a korban for a cow? This is nuts. It's nothing. This is, it's disgusting what you guys are doing. It has no power. I'll do it. If, fine, if you want to bring. I'm just telling you. This has no power. I don't know what you guys are trying to do over here. This is a powerless object. It's garbage. It's nothing. He was degrading the golden calf in front of the Jews and he was degrading these korbanot that the Jews were bringing. Now you might think to yourself, what's wrong with that? 
Sounds great to me. I mean, he was telling the Jews, like, stop. This calf has no powers. That's what he was doing. This is what Moshe also said to Aaron. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu came to Aaron. He couldn't understand why Aaron was involved in such a thing. So Moshe Rabbeinu, the first thing that asked him was, what did these people do to you to make you do this? Like, how bad was it? How threatened were you to do such a thing? Because Moshe Rabbeinu knew well that this is not his brother. Like, he would not, like... He did not make the Jews worship anything. In fact, he would have done worse. He would have done the opposite. Umut but however, Moshe Rabbeinu understand that a mistake happened over here. What happened? Umut sheyidonu keshogagim. It would have been better, now don't try this at home, but it would have been better if the Jews would have been judged as unintentional sinners than be judged as intentional sinners. This is going to be very difficult to understand. But what really happened was, basically, it would have been better if Aharon Akohan would have let the Jews bring their korbanot to the golden calf. And Hashem would have said, listen, you know, they didn't know, they were nervous, Moshe Rabbeinu left, the golden calf came out talking, eating, they really thought it's from my throne. I don't know what Hashem would have put it as an excuse there, right? It wasn't intentional. They thought it actually has powers and they wanted to connect to me. And through it, they wanted a connection to me. Therefore, it wasn't an intentional sin. I can somehow fix this. I can still help them. But when Aharon Cohen came and proved to them that it's nonsense, what did the Jews do? They continued. They still brought the korbanot. That made the Jews sin intentional. Like, no, yeah, we know it's got no power. We're still bringing korbanot. That made all the Jews sin intentionally, which made the avera ten times worse for them. And that caused what Hashem said, that He wanted to annihilate the entire Jewish nation. It was for that. So Aharon HaKohen, so to speak, in a way, brought hatred between Hashem and Bnei Israel. And brought possible destruction for all of Am Yisrael because of one, one misjudgment of a situation. <coughs> you might ask, like, seriously, you're gonna put Aaron on a Microsoft like that? Like that bad? That's outside the Kimar. Everything is calculated. So, according in Hashem's eyes, you should have known better. You should have calculated a little better. For us, we're nobody to judge these people. We're not, we're, I don't think we're, we're not even considered human beings compared to like people like Moshe and Aharon. Right? Like the Gemara says, the Gemara says, if our, if our uh, ancestors were humans, we're, we're donkeys. Like, we're not, we're not considered much when it comes to the level they were. Right? So everything that we're saying about Aharon, Akohan, and everybody else, even those that worship the golden calf, everything that we are saying is what's already in the Chachamim, it's what's already brought down for us to learn a lesson. In no way, shape, or form are we really judging them as people that make mistakes or whatnot. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to learn what the situation was so we can learn from it. So that's what happened. <clears throat> he should have let them bring these so that they shouldn't be judged as intentional sinners. This is what it says in Devarim. That's why it says Hashem became angered very much with Aharon and he wanted to destroy him. Because he made it so that God will judge the Jews as intentional sinners. And hashmada is kilui banim, which means destruction of a seed. Total annihilation, total erase. So we see in the Midrash <clears throat> that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not angered by the actions of Aharon for making the Egel himself, for making the golden calf. It was actually... The fact that he made it that the Jews worshipped it on purpose. If would have left it alone, they would have worshipped it, 
And they would have said, oh, we thought it had powers. We thought Hashem gave it powers. We thought, how are we supposed to know? It's a gold object, eating, talking. We didn't know. We thought you gave us permission through it. It's one of those questions. The question was, don't you think Aharon Kohen would have been rebuked if he would not have intervened? I would say, in this situation, maybe not. Because again, Khur intervened and he was killed on the spot. Aharon's intention was for the good. So your intention was to stall. They didn't work out the way you wanted it to be. But like now just, now calculate it in a different way. There are, believe it or not, as I've always said before, and I've always mentioned a disclaimer when I say this, right? Disclaimer is that, before I say this, I'll tell you this. What I usually say is, Torah Tenaqadosh Judaism is not always black and white. And then some people take that the wrong way as a license to do what you want. That's the disclaimer. It is not a license to do what you want. Judaism is not black and white doesn't mean that not everything's bad and good. No, everything is bad and good. There's only one emet. There's only one truth. Emet is emet. Wrong is not right. And right is not wrong. That's the truth. However, sometimes in Judaism, when we say it's not black and white, um, sometimes in Judaism, a lot more thought goes into a situation that you would think. When you would think there's, there was a situation that is so black and white to you that of course you have to do it this way. For sure, this is the right thing to do. When you go and ask a Rav, you'll be surprised. The Rav will tell you, no, actually do the other way. Or they'll be like, leave it alone. It's better that way. And they might not even tell you why. This has happened to me before. Right? In relationships, in different things, when I ask the Rav, like, hey, listen, isn't it better if I tell, go tell them? The Rav will be like, no, it's not. Leave it alone. It's fine. And to me, it's like, whoa, let, the, let it be the way it is. And then when, when, I, when you learn more, you think back and you go, oh, if I had intervened, the Averot might have been 10 times worse. Right? So, Aharon, Kohen, Moshe Rabbeinu, these were people that their mind level, their thought process was faster than speed of whatever. <laughs> right? It, mere like split seconds they could make a decision on the spot as to what is the right decision to make right now might not even look good later on but this is the decision and we've seen that with our avot we've seen these decisions being made in different occasions so that's what was that's the ta'ana so to speak that is the question on Aharon Kohen. he could have made that decision at that moment Od. furthermore the Amrin al the Avodah Zarah it says in Avodah Zarah, page Dalet Amud Bet. Lo hayus. Now, we're going to go back to something we said a few weeks ago. I'll recap for those that weren't here. If you guys already thought about it, tell me that you already did think about it, okay? Now, we said something a couple of weeks ago about the Chet Egel. Y'all remember this? Please, somebody say they remember, so at least I'll feel like someone listens. Okay, I'm kidding. But... What did we say about the Chet HaEgel a few weeks ago in Parshat Kitisa? We said that it was preordained for the Jews to sin at the Chet HaEgel. That's what the Zerah Shimshon brought from different Midrashim. That it was preordained that the Jews should sin collectively at the Chet HaEgel. It was supposed to happen. Hashem wanted the Jews to worship the golden calf. We said why? We said because... Why? Should I say why or you want to say why? She let me say it. <laughs> so I'll say it. You guys know the famous story about Einstein? One time Einstein, this, this is said about Einstein, I've heard it many times, it's said about Einstein. Don't go research and be like, Rabbi, that actually never happened because you'll be a nerd at that. That moment, I'll call you a nerd, okay? Because the story is not as important as the outcome of it. So it says that Einstein was with his shofar at the time, this is where he was, his name was well known, and he was going to different places talking about his theory of relativity and so on and so forth, right? 
So they're talking about all this stuff and they get into this discussion where a chauffeur kind of makes it look like what Einstein does is not so, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not such a big deal. He says, look, you know, I've been going around with you long enough. Like, I pretty much learned everything. Like, I understand, but like, you've explained to him and, I, and I've got it. I don't know what's the big deal about like, eh, the theory, you know, you know. So Einstein says, so you think you could do what I could do? He says, absolutely. Like, with my eyes closed. He says, I have an idea. He says, what? He says, look, where we're going in those days, there, believe it or not, there was no internet when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Right? So... No one actually knew what Einstein looked like, where he was going to lecture. So Einstein said, no one knows what I look like, so who, what's to hear what we do? You give the TED talk, <laughs> right? You give the talk, I'll be your chauffeur. I'll stand by you and you do the talk. He goes, I think that's a fantastic idea. I can do it, which is fine. You can do it, do it. So they go up there and he's doing the talk about that theory and he's hitting them crazy. Like he's got it all. He's got it all down. Literally, he knows everything. And then some questions come, he's answering some questions, and then one question hits him, and he's like stuck. He doesn't know the answer. And in a split second he goes, how could you even ask such a question? That is so dumb that even my chauffeur could answer that question. Come over here, I want you to answer this question so these people see how dumb that question was, right? So, <laughs> they say that story that Einstein takes a place as the chauffeur and actually answers the question. I, this, I heard this as a true story. Now again, I don't know, I didn't Google it. It doesn't sound like it? Who, how would you know? <laughs> but, once again, I have no idea how we got to it. How did we get to me saying that story? I don't know. You're Einstein, I'm the chauffeur. I know what story I just shared, Shauna. <laughs> you are not helpful. Anyway, so we were saying, we said by the Chet HaEgel, um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu <clears throat> wanted B'nai, oh, I asked you, I said, you want to give the answer? And you're like, no, you go ahead. That's how we came to that story. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm just like crack myself up. So, so a few weeks ago, Hashem was the Zara Shimshon brought many different sources that said Hashem actually wanted the Jews to sit at sit at the Chet Egel. Why? Because we had there was a few times in history when individuals sinned and they were forgiven with the power of Teshuvah. If you're an individual and you sin individually, no matter how severe your sin is, you have one or two of your ancestors to look back to and say, you know what? What I did is not as bad as what they did. If Hashem forgave them, He'll forgive me too. Right? That's how Teshuvah works. You have to see that Hashem has forgiven before for you to know that it's possible. There was never a situation of a national sin being forgiven. So if Bnei Israel nationally would come and sin, they had no proof that Hashem would ever forgive them. So why do Teshuvah? So Hashem wanted a moment where the entire nation of Am Yisrael is together as one, for them together to sin as one, and Hashem to accept their Teshuvah, their repentance, they'll all repent together. Hashem will accept it so that in the future, when we sin again, which we have, will always know that no matter what, even if it's a national sin, we all sin together the same sin, Hashem will forgive. Because it's happened before. Good so far? That was what we said. So now the Zerah Shemeshul is going to talk about that again. Hello, you're telling me that Aharon Akoin sinned by making the Jews sin intentionally. Well, we know that you wanted them to sin intentionally. So we're back to square one. What was Aaron Cohen's sin? If you wanted Bnei Israel to really sin at the golden calf, so that they'll have what to look, look, like, look up to, so to speak, when they want to do teshuvah, then the sin of the golden calf was preordained by you. Then what was Aaron Cohen's sin here? 
If he made the Jews sin, what was the problem? And even more so, let's do it inside. Who's not following? Okay, if I say who's following, I'm afraid of how many hands are going to be held up when I say who's following. So I'm just not going to ask. Everybody's good. We're A-OK. Oh. The Yalkut says on a pasuk, V'hamayim lahem homa. The Yalkut says on the pasuk, when the Jews came out of Egypt and there was uh, the split, the splitting of the sea happened, right? It says, V'hamayim lahem homa. And the water became like a wall for the Jews. Right? Over there, the pasuk is translated to read as chema. Instead of choma, it's translated as chema. <coughs> what is chema? <coughs> chema means, huh? <laughs> That's funny. <coughs> chema <coughs> is butter. Everybody, no. <coughs> yes, <coughs> please. <coughs> She's right. Chema is butter. That was a good one. One point for you. <laughs> Chema means anger. So Chachamim translated and say when the sea split for the Jews and when the Torah says <laughs> it was actually saying that the Ma'im was Chema. Chema means the Ma'im was angry. In fact, the water wanted to close on the Jews. It was very angered by them. Milashon Kaas, it was angered. Why? Because Ahmad <clears throat> Samel, the Sarshal Esav, the ministering angel of Esav, stood before Hashem and he said to him, Ribono Shel Olam, Lo Avdu Israel, Avodah Zarah Ba Mitzrayim, didn't these Jews sin in Egypt? Didn't they worship Avodah Zarah? Didn't they worship idols? Vatao said to him, Nisim, and now you're doing uh, uh, such a miracle for them and all these miracles and splitting the sea for them? They should be killed. Why are you doing? Why are you splitting the sea for a nation that worshipped idols? You should be killing them. <clears throat> and that's why it says, The waters were like literally hanging in midair, like, what should we do? Should we kill them? Should we not kill them? Do they deserve Mita or not? When the, <clears throat> when the ministering angel of the ocean heard, The ministering angel of the ocean became even more angry. And he said, you know what? The angel of Esav is right. What am I doing? I'm totally putting away my nature, my nature, my call of nature, which is to, for, for me to be a sea. And I'm splitting for what? For a bunch of idolaters? Why would I, why would I listen to these people? He wanted to um, drown them. Right away, HaKadosh Baruch Hu answers the angel of Esav. And he says, You fool. Do you really think that Bnei Israel worshipped um, idols in Mitzrayim? But they, they were worshipping idols because of their hardship and slavery and all the negativity that was around them. What did you expect from them to do? They didn't want to. They were enslaved, they were tortured, they were taken advantage of. And that's why people that are down do a lot of stupid things. So you can't really blame them for what they did. You think I'm going to punish them for unintentionally worshipping idols? I can't do that. It's not right. The Egyptians intentionally did what they did. So they deserve what they're going to receive. The Jews never intentionally did this. If they weren't under pressure by the Egyptians, if they were not enslaved, they would have never done these things towards me. Right? So there he says, Atad dan mezid keones. Sorry. Atad dan shogek mezid. Are you going to judge unintentional like intentional? Are you going to judge honest beratzon? Are you going to judge accidental like on purpose? Would you do that? That's what Hashem says to the angels. That's why the Jews were saved. Nothing happens to them. Now, we said that when the Jews in, unintentionally sinned, HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't expect anything from them. Did He want us to do Teshuvah? No. 
We didn't at that, at that time didn't even know we were supposed to do teshuvah. Why would we be expected to do teshuvah? It was unintentional. We sinned unintentionally. It was, a, it was a time of slavery. What do you expect from us? That's why even today, Rahman al Lu'alani, we should never know of this. <clears throat> my, my Rebbe, he should be well, 120, Rav Asher Kalmanovich from the Mir Yeshiva. Remember one time he told me something that really stuck with me. He said, if you see a Holocaust survivor that denies God, never say a word to them. Because you cannot even imagine what these people have been through. Who are you to come and teach them a lesson? What do you expect? They saw families destroyed. They saw worlds destroyed. Like you can't even imagine. Right? So like you, you were brought up in a great world. You have had everything. So you chose God. You chose Shabbat. You chose Kashrut. Right? whoop de doo The pressures that they had... You can't judge them. So too here. HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying, you want me to judge B'nai Israel for worshipping idols in the Mitzrayim? That's nothing. I'm not. No need for Teshuvah. Uma'ata. So now, <clears throat> now that we're asking, that Malachim B'Shash and Israfu B'nai Aharon, when, now we're going to go back to our original question. When the sons of Aharon were burnt alive, what did the ministering angels say? And we said what? It was because of the sin of Aharon. The sons of Aharon, Nadav and Avihu, were killed because of the sin of their father. Because he deserved keliyah, he deserved destruction for making the Jews sin intentionally against God. Beshash and Yisrefu ben Aharon, when the sons of ben Aharon were killed because of the sin of Aharon by the Maaseh Agel, the Muchach Mikan, Shachadosh Baruch Hu, Ka'asalav, that Hashem would have been angry at Aharon HaKohen, because he made the Jews become intentional sinners. The ministering angels came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu again, and they said, so he says, <clears throat> these ministering angels came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu asking, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, hold on a second. Aaron HaKohen did nothing wrong. He was supposed to do this. Right? Aaron was supposed to do what he did. He did the right thing. Why? So they asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if not, if Aaron really made a mistake here by making the Jews be intentional sinners, Lama karata tayam lifnei Israel. We said the ministering angel said what to Hashem before? When Nadav and Avihu died, the ministering angel said to Hashem, Why did you split the sea for these people? We said, What does that have to do with the death of, death of Nadav and Avihu? So now the angels, now it's going to make sense. They came to Hashem and they said, Hashem, why, if you think Aharon did something wrong by making the Jews intentionally sin, then why did you split the sea for the Jews at Yamsuf? Let's see, why did you split the sea for the, for the Jews at Yamsuf? Because they were unintentional sinners. That's why you split the sea, because they were unintentional sinners. Which means, they were not intentional sinners. Which means, if they were intentional, if they do something intentional, there is no proof for the Jews that you would ever forgive them. They know, let's see, they know that if they do something unintentional, you'll forgive them. Because you've done that before, by the splitting of the sea. But they don't know if they do something intentionally also, you'll forgive them. They don't know that. How do they know that? They have no proof from their past. The fact that they sinned intentionally at the Egel HaZahav, and you forgiving them, is going to be for Dorot, for generations to come. Something for the Jews to say, you know what? One time we intentionally went against God, and He forgave us then too. So if we also sin this time intentionally, He'll forgive us for sure, because it's been bad before. So the ministering angels were saying, why did you split the sea? You split the sea for them because you couldn't punish them because it was un unintentional. Now you have another scenario which is, which is intentional. Now you should forgive them here too. You want this. Because you want proof that intentional sin will also be forgiven as a national, you know, 
when the Jews nationally sin. Right? Because look, they were saying, these Jews worshipped idols in Mitzrayim. They've worshipped idols before. But it was unintentional then. So for them to unintentionally worship idols, you don't need that. You've already forgiven for that before. So the Jews know, unintentionally worshipping idols, Hashem will forgive. But they don't know that you'll ever forgive them for intentionally worshipping idols. So what Aaron did was great. It was for your sake. If you forgive them for intentionally worshipping idols this time, the Jews will forever know, not only will Hashem forgive us for un unintentional sins, but if we intentionally worship idols and we do teshuva, Hashem will forgive us. That's why they were asking Hashem, when Nadav and Avihu died for the punishment of their father, making the, making the Jews sin intentionally, the angels were saying to Hashem, why did you, why did you split the sea then? What's the, you punished his children for what? Why? Then why did you split the sea? El avadai. However, we must say, Shein ata el arak al mezid. Hold on. Sorry. Shein ata ma'anish. Okay. Okay, we did. Hashta. One second. Did that also? Sorry, I did a whole bunch of it outside. Let me just go fast forward. He says, because if the Jews were not intentional sinners, they would have not been able to see a way for teshuva for the public. How do we know that the public, the entire nation of Am Israel, can do teshuva together? How do we know? You know how we know? Because of the Cheta Ege. If it wasn't for worshipping the golden calf then, we would have never known that we could together, collectively do Teshuvah for something so horrible as even worshipping idols. And if it wasn't for what Aharon Akwen said, then the Jews would have only been judged for worshipping the golden calf for Shogagim, as unintentional sinner, sinners. Ketzad, Ketzad haya hora teshuvah l'rabim. Then if they, were, they would be judged as, as unintentional sinners for the golden calf too, then we would have been left with nothing again. We would have had no way of knowing that we could be forgiven for intentional sins. Ve'im ken mashas Aharon. And if so, what Aharon HaKohen did, kachaya ra'u'i la'asot. This is actually what he was supposed to do. He did, the angels were saying that Aharon did exactly as you wanted it to happen. And as we said before, Hashem, you wanted the Jews to sin at the golden calf. So Aharon helped you. What was the sin here? Orale. Any questions? Yes. So for the sin of Avodah Zarah, it's the person themselves that is being forced to do it and they have to give their life not to do it. Not when it's somebody else. So if Aharon had a gun to his head saying, worship this idol or we'll kill you, then he's, he would be obligated to give up his life. But you bring a good point. This is what we're talking about. Worshipping idols is one of the cardinal sins, which means the person, if, even if they're being forced, yes, they have to give up their life and not worship idols. That's why it was such a prime example. That's what the Malachim were telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You have a sin, one of the three sins that a Jew is supposed to give up their life and not do. That's how bad it is. This would have been a great example of the Jews doing it on purpose and you forgiving them. And for generations, the Jews would always know, no matter how bad you go, Hashem will always forgive you. That's what you want, right? At the end of the day, that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. For us to know that He will always forgive us. So why are you punishing Aaron's children? It's going to get even more confusing. 
This is one of those shiurim that plays with your mind of time, kind of. For me, it was like, whoa. Right? Now he's going to say, I don't think so. Thank you. Heshivu haserufim. Therefore, we said, what did Nadav and Avihu answer? When, when the Malachim said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why did you split the sea for the Jews? Because Nadav and Avihu were killed. To question God as to, hey, Adam did nothing wrong over here. He made the Jews sin intentionally for you. Right? So why did you kill his children? It says, Heshiva Serufim. Then, then what happened? The sons of Aharon, the Serufim, the burnt ones, as referred to here, they answered, Hashem, Hashem, please bring us back to you, return us. This is what the sons of Aharon, the Neshamot, said to Hashem. What does that mean? Kelomar, as to say, Beloze, even without this question of why Hashem did you split the sea, this question that we posed right now on Hashem, Yesh kushal elokeinu. They were asking Hashem another question. They were saying what? Shara kadosh baruchu hiniach she Yisrael yasu ha'egel shede kede lehorot teshuval rabim not rabim. Hashem wanted Bnei Israel to sin so that He could teach them that they could do teshuva and always return. And if the Egel would not have been done, there would be no possibility for that. They would never do Teshuvah. And Because Jews would think that Teshuvah never helps. If that wouldn't happen. Aval, however, but after the Egel Azahav was built, Ah, so it's, it's like a side note here. What they're actually saying is that Hashem, let's say you also, even if they were Mezidim, even if the Jews were on purpose uh, uh, intentional sinners, if you're going to teach the Bnei Israel that there is always a way to do Teshuvah, even if you're sinning on purpose intentionally, let's say the Jews don't sin. Uh, let's say the Jews don't do Teshuvah for their intentional sin. You know what's going to happen? That's it. The Jews are goners. What you're basically saying is, I've given you a key here. Even if you sin intentionally, I will forgive you. All you have to do is do Teshuvah. Let's say the generations go a thousand years later, two thousand years later, and the Jews sinned intentionally, but they don't do Teshuvah. You know how bad that is? They were telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know how bad you're making it? Because you're telling them, I've given you a gift, and if they don't accept this gift, it's going to be even worse. You're making it even worse. You're telling them, listen, I'm allowing you to sin intentionally, and I'll even allow you to do Teshuvah and come back. All you have to do is repent. What if they don't repent? You know how angry you'll be then? It would have been better if you would not have expected them, them to re re repent. Just, just, Benashuva, you return us. That's what Bnei Aharon said. Hashivinu Hashem Elecha Benashuva Kikidem. Don't expect the Jews to do Teshuva, please. Because then you're putting it on the entire nation. What if they don't do Teshuva? Then what? You're going to destroy them? Because they won't do Teshuva? Don't do that either, please. So they were going one up on the Malachim. They were saying, forget wanting Bnei Israel to do Teshuvah. Let's say they don't. What are you going to do then? It's going to be bad. You're going to destroy the Jews? So they said, Hashivin Hashem Elecha. You return us. Don't wait for the Jews to do Teshuvah. You be the better one. And you just return us. You forgive us on your own. That's what you should do. You're HaKadosh Baruch Hu, aren't you? You should just return us yourself. Don't wait for Bnei Israel to do Teshuvah. 
So when the angels said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, you wanted the Aharon to make it intentional. You wanted the Jews to intentionally sin because you wanted them to ask for forgiveness for intentional sins. So what wrong did Aharon do? The sons of Aharon came and said, forget about what wrong Aharon did. I'll give you one step higher. Why would you even want the Jews to ask for forgiveness after they've done something intentionally? Why don't you just forgive them yourself, your God? You know we make stupid mistakes. Even if we do them intentionally, why should you wait for us to ask for forgiveness? You be the greater one. Why are you angry? On our father Aharon HaKohen. Al Shasa Mezidim that he made Bene Israel intentional sinners. Halo Af Ata Sheinachtale Israel La Sota Egel. You yourself, when you allowed Bene Israel to make the golden calf, Kede Shedorota Baim Yuni Donim Kemezidim, so that later on, when the Jews intentionally sin, Deim Lohayon Zem Hamase, if this Cheta Egel was not there, they would have been judged as unintentional sinners. If they don't do teshuvah, but the vice versa is true too. If they intentionally sin and they do te- don't do teshuvah, you'll never forgive them. That's a lost case. So why would we want that? So he says to answer this question, he himself, the Zera Shimshon, also has he mamash in this ma'amar. You see that he himself also has a question on this, saying it's like a very confusing back and forth. So that's why he says. It must be that you have to answer this question as follows. Hashem knew that a time will never come that the Jews will never do Teshuvah. That's not going to happen. Hashem already knew that it's never going to happen that the Jews won't do Teshuvah. It'll always be there. That's always going to be there. So I'm not worried about the fact that the Jews are going to sin intentionally and then not do teshuvah and I might have to destroy them. It's not going to happen. He knew that. This is the key. It says even if they themselves would not want it, would not have wanted to do teshuvah on their own, Hashem would force the Jews to do so. How? We just passed the holiday of Purim. The entire story of Purim was what? It was a masquerade. Hashem was never going to allow Haman to kill Ben Israel. The Jews had sinned and they needed to do Teshuvah, but they were not doing it on their own. So what did Hashem do? He put a king upon us and a Haman upon us with harsh decrees and the Jews woke up. Like, oh boy, you know why this is happening? Because we sinned back then and we never did Teshuvah. The Jews did Teshuvah, we accepted the Torah once again and Hashem forgave us and we rebuilt the second Beit HaMikdash. And the Gemara says that happens. Hashem is very patient. He waits and He waits and He waits for Bnei Israel to do Teshuvah. If they don't do Teshuvah, Chas Shalom. He appoints leaders around the world to bring the pressure on for us to wake up and do Teshuvah. We should never want that to happen. We would always want to do Teshuvah on our own because that pressure is not good. It's not good. We know the Holocaust was, was, was a repeat of Purim. What could have happened in the time of Purim in Persia repeated itself and it actually went, it went through. The plan went through during the Holocaust. Millions of Jews. We have to do Teshuvah. However, Hashem knew at that moment already that even if Bnei Israel don't do Teshuvah on their own, I'm not going to destroy them. I'll just make the pressure so harsh on them that they will be forced to do Teshuvah. They will remember because at the end of the day, we are all, we're all Jews. We all know Hashem exists. We all know that we love Him. We all want to be connected to Him. But other things happen, so we you know, go astray. But when push comes to shove, we always come back. Sadly, at the hardest times, right? Now, <clears throat> so he says, if we give this answer, this is I'm saying this is why I'm saying the Zerashim Shon himself is a little 
back and forth with this idea. So he says, if we give this answer, then, then again we're saying that Hashem is really bringing the Jews back Himself. We're not doing Teshuvah, He's putting the pressure. We're not doing it ourselves, He's the one who's returning us. So we have to answer as follows. That the sin of, we could say, that the sin of That we cannot say, Aaron Akohen should have done what he did to make Bnei Israel sin intentionally. What the Zerah Shimshon brings out is true. What Aaron Akohen did could be looked upon as a good thing. He made the Jews sin intentionally, which was what Hashem wanted anyway, so that we'll have proof later on in later generations that Hashem forgives intentional sins. Hashem was telling Bnei Aaron, I didn't need help. I didn't want Aaron to do that. If I want Bnei Israel to be forgiven, if I want them to do Teshuvah, I have my ways of making them do Teshuvah. I have my own ways. You don't plan for me, you need to do what you need to do that's right. That's basically the outcome of this whole drush. That Hashem was basically saying, yes, the calculation was Aaron was trying to do the job that I wanted done. Thank you, but no thank you. I need you to be doing what you need to do. I'll do what I need to do. Don't say, if I don't make them be mezidim, I want to make Bnei Israel sin intentionally so that later on it'll be better for them. No. Don't make them sin intentionally. I'd rather them be sinning unintentionally right now and in later generations, if they don't have what to go on and say, how do we know that we could do Teshuvah when we sinned intentionally on a national level? You don't worry about that. I'll make that work. You know what I'll do? I'll put the pressure on them. Well, they'll notice me and they'll do Teshuvah even then. I didn't need you to make them intentionally sin against me. That made things worse. At this moment, you brought a separation between me and Bnei Israel. The future didn't matter right now. At this moment, at the height of our nation, when Bnei Israel were accepting the Torah, I didn't want this kind of separation. Later on, if, they, if I wanted them to do Teshuvah, whether it was for intentional sins, unintentional sins, don't worry. I got the answers, I'll bring a king, I'll bring prime ministers, I'll bring, I'll bring presidents, I'll bring world leaders to put the heat on them and they'll do Teshuvah. Even for the intentional, intentional sins, even, even though they don't have any proof that, I'll, that in the past I would have forgiven them. But when I bring the pressure, the Jews will come back to me. I have my ways of bringing Bnei Israel back to me. I don't need help. This kind of, to me, in my mind, also goes back on, you know, when we... You could ask a question on this also, but I was thinking like in Egypt, why did Paro, why was Paro punished? for enslaving the Jews if Hashem had promised Abraham that he's going to enslave the Jews right so why power get punished so Hashem answers yeah I said they'll be punished did I say you should punish them why did you jump to the occasion like it was your <laughs> pleasure right so this is kind of in the lahavdil ben kodesh lechol. We're not comparing Aharon to Paro chas v'shalom. We're saying Hashem has this way of making things work. He doesn't need our help in the celestials in, in His works. That's what His way of saying to Bnei Aharon also that don't worry, I have my ways of bringing my children back to me. Even if they don't know that I'll forgive them, I'll make them realize that I'll forgive them. That I can do. And that was it's a. It's a very, very powerful message. It really, to me, what spoke to me is that the Zerah Shimshon brings out the fact that we Jews have a very direct connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's what Hashem was showing, talk, in this Midrash, is brought out with the conversation of Hashem and the Malachim. That Hashem was literally telling the Malachim, you're, you're missing one thing here. I have a direct connection with my children. If I want my kids to be close to me, I can make it happen. I will make it happen. I don't need anybody's help to do it. 
if everybody just, just does what they need to do, bringing my kids close to me, I can do that myself. Like Hashem has done so many times. Unfortunately, sometimes it was in a very negative way. But it helped. But it worked. You know, time of Purim with King Achashverosh. Within a few years, we rebuilt the Beit HaMikdash. Why? Because we had the fear of Haman on top of us. And the time of the Holocaust, with so many losses, unfortunate, it should not have happened. But the outcome was, shouldn't have been the outcome of a Holocaust. But sadly it was. The outcome was so many yeshivot around the world. You think there were this many seminaries and yeshivas before the Holocaust? No. The outcome was a state of Israel. You think the state of Israel was a political thing? No, it was the tears, the cries, the sacrifices of Am Yisrael in the, in the death chambers. It was the answer of Am Yisrael praying together in hardship. Hashem knows how to bring His children back. Even if it's through hardship, unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way. We have the key. It's called teshuva to make sure that it doesn't happen that way. But Hashem has His ways. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. Amen.